Um, I want to turn to the recent um, M&A mergers and acquisitions activity, yes. of which there has been quite a bit. Um, yes, for those for those that aren't aware or need reminding, so Tarsus has been acquired by Informa. Uh, Hive is possibly going to be taken private by Providence, um, which obviously is a, a large shareholder and closer still. Uh, and Cvent, sorry, said that again. Sixty-four percent. Sixty-four percent. Sixty-four percent of closer still. Sure. Um, and Cvent have been purchased by Blackstone. Um, Owners of Clarion. Yep. Starting with the Informer Tarsus deal, um, just generally, was that a surprise to you? Were you expecting it? You had no. What, what was your What's your general impression? No, it was a surprise to everybody, including Doug. I think. Um, <laughs> I had Doug was, on the show. Um, yeah. I know you've spoken to him. Um, yeah. It was. It was. It was surprising. It wasn't surprising that Informa wanted to buy Tarsus. There was no surprise there. They'd made a couple of previous approaches. But there was certain things about it which were very surprising. Um, one is that the deal was start to finish four weeks, yeah. which is amazing in in this world. It, it suggests you know, the amount of due diligence you can do in four weeks is really very, very small indeed. Um, so for Informa, it was, you know, that, they knew the company well enough. They didn't need to go into the numbers. At least that was their view. Um, they wanted to do the deal. It was an opportunity. And after all, the size Informer are, uh, you know, they don't, you know, they'll, they'll turn over, what, 11 billion sterling this year, I hope, if I'm an Informer shareholder. Um, you know, they, they, they don't they don't grow by picking off shows that are that are generating a 1 million of EBITDA. So there aren't that many opportunities. Um, and it was opportunistic. Um among the things that were surprising about it was that Charterhouse did not seek any alternative bids. Uh, you would have thought they would in particular have approached Providence and they didn't. They, yeah. they said, yeah, we'll do the deal. We'll do it straight away. Um, and we will um, uh, will effectively agree a number pretty quickly, which they did. And instead of going to somebody else like Providence or Blackstone, uh, you know, will you top this bid? They didn't. Now that in itself is very unusual for a private equity company. Mm. And, and I don't claim to know the inside story on it. Uh, the other thing which is very, very unusual for a private equity deal is, is they took half the consideration in shares. Yeah. Half in cash, half in shares. Again, very unusual for a private equity company. Now, I, I think you can, I mean, I'm an informer shareholder, so I certainly would hope that informer shares will increase in value in the foreseeable future. Uh, and you could argue that owning informer shares was quite a good, um, uh, not a stupid act on, on, on any, anybody's part. But again, to take half the deal in stock, which makes it much more attractive for informer, of course, because mm. they have to uh, throw out far less cash for the deal, is again, very, very unusual. So you, you have a couple of real oddities in that deal. The third oddity, which I, I think you spoke to Doug about, was Informer claiming that it was 9.9 .9 times profits. Mm -hmm. um, for anybody who, listening who, who isn't uh, used to this kind of thing, that means that if, if your profit's a pound, then the, the buyer has paid £9.90 pence for, for the company. I mean, that just uh, generated a very loud chuckle in the financial community as being a, a piece of absurdity because immediately following that 9.9 .9 times, Informer said uh, that is after allowing for 20 million of synergies. I don't think they put synergies in inverted commas, but they should have done. And what they meant by 20 million of synergies was, of course, 20 million of cost cuts. And most of that 20 million is going to be in salaries, clearly. Sure. I'd be surprised. I mean, D Doug ran a very, very tight ship by the standards of trade show companies, and I'd be, be very interested to know where Informer are going to get 20 million of savings from. But clearly, that's what mm. they're saying. So you, you can't say 9.9 .9 times. Most people looking at the deal, like Steve Mollington and, and others, are saying it's somewhere between 12 and 14 times, probably 13 plus uh, it w w was, was what the real deal was. Uh, there's also an oddity with Tarsus in that they have these two massive biennials, um, labor lectures, yes. the Dubai Air Show. And that makes it very, very hard to annualize profits because you have to smooth the biennials over 
over a 24 month period. So it's, sure. it's hard to, to, to build that in as well. So as a shareholder of Informa, um, yeah. you're broadly happy with the move? Yeah, yeah. I think from Informa's point of view, it was one of the deals that they could do. I mean, they, they're, they're presenting themselves now as a, as a trade show business. They're obviously sure. not 100 percent trade shows, but um, uh, they're f- f- first and foremost a trade show business. And, and yes, it was a deal that could be done. I mean, there are there, there are of the six or seven significant size companies, there are very few deals that can be done yeah. of that kind of size. Sure. I want to turn attentions to the the proposed Hive deal. Um, yeah. And for those that aren't aware, Hive is a publicly listed company. Uh, so I should say it's it's, it's proposed at the moment. Um, so it's not certain to go through. Um, what do you think the benefit just generally, and we'll come back to high specifically in a minute, or it would be of taking a business private uh, after being public? Well, you cut a lot of costs out. Uh, I mean, companies that are private and have to report every, well, in the UK every six months, in, in the US every three months, uh, have to spend a great deal of time on preparing um, preparing their annual accounts. They have to spend a great deal of time on, on, on shareholder relationships. Uh, sure. They need to employ PR firm, uh, city PR firms, which I promise you is not uh, having having run uh, publicly quoted mm. companies, um, which is not uh, cheap at all. And you have to spend a great deal of your management time um, massaging your shareholder base and massaging your uh, massaging the city generally. Now, a, a private company doesn't have to do any of that, so so that's quite a significant saving. Um, so uh, one can one can take that into account. I, I should say, even though Providence owns sixty four percent of Closer Still, um, I know no more about this deal than you do, Dan. I uh, sure. we've not done any uh, because it's a publicly quoted company. Providence can't talk about it to outsiders, sure. and Closer Still is an outsider as far as this deal is concerned. So literally, I know no more than than you do about it. But one other thing. Um, which is a relatively new piece of information, is that it's not actually a Providence bid. Uh, the, the company that's bidding for Hive is actually a yes. joint venture between Providence and Searchlight, another private equity company. So, so actually, okay. it, 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 this is a different entity uh, from the entity that owns Closest Tell. It's, it's two private equity sure. companies coming together to make this bid. There's nothing unusual about that. I mean, private equity companies regularly join forces to make bids. But, but it makes it uh, that alone makes it quite interesting. Um, benefits are high, if, um, in your um, opinion. I understand you don't have a sort of inside view, but just from an outsider, I don't, I don't have an inside view on Providence and the deal. I, I yeah. have a I, obviously, I have a lot of information about Hive. I know their shows very well, obviously. Sure. I mean, everybody knows Spring Fair, everybody knows Bet, everybody knows Call Winding. You know, we all we all know these shows. Um, there is there are certain there's one particular oddity about this um about this prospective deal yeah. and again this is only from public records this is only from comment in the financial times sure. times and elsewhere uh but it but it's a real oddity you've probably read down that um quite a few of the hive shareholders the institutional shareholders uh have said they're not happy with the deal sure uh, and m and g in particular, which is a very, very big shareholder in Hive, has said they think Hive is worth considerably more money. And um, I don't actually know where this information comes from, but it comes from within Hive. It was probably a, 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 an annual report or a half year report where the company said that it was hopeful that within the foreseeable future um, it could grow to a turnover of two hundred and fifty million. And an EBIT uh, and, a, and a, a, an operating percentage of twenty, uh, sorry, thirty percent, which means turnover of two hundred and fifty million. This is sterling, uh, and op- an operating profit of seventy-five million. Now, if the if that's what the company thinks it's going to do in the immediate future or in the near future, then it's very hard to see why it would have accepted why the board would have accepted an offer which effectively values it at only five times that. I, I mean, the offer, 
equity enterprise value, you could call it 320, you could call it 400, you could call it 481. There's a whole range of ways of interpreting the offer. But, but if in two years' time, Hive can really make 75 million, then buying it for 400 million is only five times earnings. So if, if the shareholders and the board believe that to be the case, why, why are they recommending the acceptance of the offer? That's, that's the oddity. And again, I'm not, very important to stress, I'm not stating sure. this out of any inside knowledge at all. I'm simply quoting uh, what is in the public domain and, and what has been reported and what has been stated by some of the Hive shareholders. Sure, but Beyond that's that a watching brief. That's a watching brief, and obviously, I think uh, there's a deadline coming up in the next couple of weeks, so we we see yeah, yeah. more, I guess, yeah, we'll right. more about that. Seventy-five percent of the shareholders have to vote in favour of the offer. Sure, right? sure. Um, and then, as I mentioned, Cvent were purchased by Blackstone. I think it was just shy of five billion dollars. Uh, yeah, it was a big one. Yeah. yeah. Um, just generally, then, that obviously shows the interest in private equity, and just and generally M and A in this activity is still in rude health um do you see this trend continuing uh and generally from a private equity perspective they're, they're still they're, they're still interested in this as a sector well as owner of a couple of very large uh, trade yeah. show assets i certainly hope so um yeah. yeah it's very interesting i mean when you when you when you cut through the undergrowth of the hive deal and the tarsus deal i mean they're they're, they're both in conventional terms, 12 to 14 times earnings. Let's call it 13 times. And 13 times earnings take, takes you back to 2018. And Clarion, which was the biggest deal around that time, was 12.8. So uh, in effect, and, and the two companies we're talking about are two of the eight, two of the seven or eight largest trade show groups in the world, excluding the MESA, which don't really count sure. in this discussion. So... Um, for, for offers to be being made around the 13 times suggests that uh, the, the the financial perception of trade show groups is is back to where it was um 2018 2019 and perhaps given that we're not that far away from the pandemic perhaps perhaps even more positive um that that would be i i, I would like to call that an objective assessment although because of my own involvement in the industry it's a little bit a little bit difficult for me to be totally objective about it, clearly, because I, sure. I am interested in it. I, and I think what's also very interesting is that it wasn't until the first quarter of this year that investors could have confidence that the industry had really come back from the pandemic. In other words, it would have been very surprising to see these deals in September 2022. Sure. But by March 23, it seems to me a very clear statement that yes, the trade show industry has come back. The pandemic has not damaged it significantly. In many ways, the the, the, the existing companies might even be stronger. And therefore, let's get our bids in now rather than wait another six or 12 months when actually these assets might be even more expensive. Um, I appreciate you. The, the answer you might give to this particular question might might be a, a guarded one, but in terms of closer still, um, yeah. obviously, it'd be no surprise that at some point uh, there'd be another exit. Um, what's do you have a, an updated view on the timeline of that? Um, how's that? Where's that looking at the moment? I, I mean, the answer is it's not so much guarded as, as honest. I, I mean, the answer yeah. is the answer is don't know. I, I, sure. I, I mean, the last closest still deal with Providence was on Christmas Eve 2018. And had you asked me then whether I would have expected an exit by 2023, I would have said yes. Yeah. I would have expected there to be an exit. Uh, the pandemic obviously changed everything. Um, the events of the last month have arguably made an exit yeah. a little bit sooner than it might have been. Um, but I'd also say that the company, and I, 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 I was going to say you would expect me to say this, wouldn't you, Dan? But uh, you used to work for Closer Steel and you know the company yeah. quite well uh, and, and you know how it works. Um, the company really is doing so well at the moment and its sectors are doing so well. I mean, essentially, medical and healthcare is half the business. Top end of IT, learning technologies is phenomenally strong. And we don't do anything else. That's all we do. 
Um, those are all sectors that are doing incredibly well. And I don't think we would want to sell the business in the immediate future because the prospects in the short term, by which I mean probably two to three years, are so very, very good. Um, sure. So uh, I no, we don't have a time scale. I certainly don't think it's tomorrow or anywhere near tomorrow. Okay.